Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do uh, most Sundays of the month. The first Sunday of every month, I do a subscriber Sunday video where subscribers send in photos of things in their yard that they're proud of. You can send in photos to this email address uh, and uh, mark the, uh, the email subscriber photos or something like that so I know what it is because I get a lot of email to uh, that account uh, at this point after showing it on the screen all these, uh, all these years. And uh, I have a lot of photos for next Sunday's video. I said last Sunday that this was Subscriber Sunday because I, I didn't look at a uh, calendar before before then, but today is the uh, 30th and uh, next uh, Sunday is the 6th. Um, but like I say, it's a, there's a lot of photos. Um, um, thanks for participating in that video. Um, probably sometime by the middle of the week, I'll cut off um, and, and the, those photos beyond that point will end up in the uh, October, um, uh, the October video. Uh, Cause it, there, like I say, there is a lot. Again, thanks for participating in that. Yesterday I put up the uh, September um, uh, gardening checklist video. I've been putting those up uh, every month of the year if you haven't watched that yet. Um, I put a lot of information uh, in each of those uh, videos. If there's something I miss in those videos, definitely go down below that video in the description and you know type something out that you do in the garden in the fall um, and it will help people in the future. Uh, I have, I will do another one of those for October, November, and December, and then I will have done the uh, 12 months uh, of the year. Again, it's hard to think of everything somebody can do in a garden in a month, but, uh, but I've done my best uh, on those. Um, I've got mulch on the driveway that I'm about to start spreading, and uh, at the point that the mulch goes down, Wednesday's update video should be great. I've got, I've already shot the video for um, drip irrigation. Um, that'll be edited once I get uh, this thing, this thing mulched and everything. And then I've got, I'm going to go through and do a, an actual tour. And then I'm going to do, break the tour down into my best annuals, perennials, shrubs, uh, in the garden, this first year in this house, things that I like, things that, uh, you know, I would do differently in the future, that kind of thing. So a lot of video content coming, uh, once I get, uh, the labor done of, uh, getting the mulch down, uh, in this backyard and in, in, in the front yard. So let's get started on the uh, questions from last week's uh, video. Um, I have 14 of them uh, that I wrote down. Uh, don't be offended if I um, don't answer your question. It's not on purpose. I'm trying to uh, keep these videos somewhere around the, uh, the 20 minute uh, mark uh, every week. And uh, I usually uh, just go through them until I have about 14 that I haven't answered or it's some other version of, um, of a question that I haven't answered before. I do have a playlist up here that I'll link in the corner if you're watching on YouTube uh, called uh, Question and Answer uh, videos. And I think there's 40 some of them in there at this point. Uh, at this point, I've answered most questions uh, that, that get asked on the channel if you wanna go through back through any of that playlist. Um, like I say, I probably have answered it before. Continue to ask it um, if, 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 if I haven't and uh, I will definitely uh, get to them. But like I say, I, I have 14 questions and uh, I've tried to keep these videos between 16, 22 minutes, something like that. So let's get started. Um, somebody asked me, they have a contorted filbert, which is a weeping, um, super interesting uh, little tree. Uh, and um, they planted it and then it lost some leaves and then it's leafing back out, but it's not leafing back out with the burgundy color that it's supposed to have. Uh, it's leafing out green. All of that I think is just transplant shock in the first year. I don't think you can really judge, and I've said this many times, it's hard to judge a plant uh, by its behavior in the first season. Uh, it really, it really, really is. And, and, and saying you're disappointed in something, and I just said, of course, I'm going to do videos on what I, what I like and didn't like about what I did in the yard this year. And of course, I'm going to be doing the same thing as judging things based on the first, uh, season, uh, in the ground. But, but really overall, I don't think, um, especially when something goes through a stress, uh, you know, if it, if it does go through a transplant shock, you know, what it does immediately after is probably not something you can judge it on. I, I would, I would think that next spring it'll wake up and be uh, just fine. Okay. Somebody asked me about North side foundation plants and they're in the South. Um, those of you in the North may not know, but the sun goes North of us, uh, in the South. And this is North of here for me. And it just absolutely cooks that side, um, for about three months. And then the rest of the year, the sun's over here and there's no sun over there at all. And so, um, uh, in the south, we do have this problem with the north side of the house being super, super, super hot uh, for about 10 weeks if you don't have any shade uh, on that side of your house. And so it is hard to determine what to grow over there. Do you put shade plants in a space that gets shade nine months out of the year? Or do you put sun plants um, in, a, in a space that gets really the hottest sun of the year 
uh, for that three months. And, and I think what you have to do is, is put some things in there and then judge uh, from there. And their little hint um, on their question, they said they had some lantana over there that had done well. Lantana absolutely loves to cook. And so if your lantana is performing well in that space, I think you're gonna be mostly full sun things. I have three lantana that I planted back here. Uh, one I've moved to the front yard where it's sunnier and it's just absolutely thriving out there. The other two that are back here actually, uh, because I start to get some shade on them by 1.30, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they're growing, but they're not performing. Um, they're not blooming as well. That'll be part of my one of those uh, the perennial video that I cover. I'll show, I'll show that. But uh, again, um, if your lantana was doing great, I would lean toward full sun things uh, for, that for that foundation space uh, on the north side. Tricky, tricky thing, though. Uh, it really is. My old house, the first few years I lived in it, that north side was terrible. I did plant a couple trees out there. I had a purple leaf plum and a, a cryptomeria on that side of the house. And it really turned that area into a nice, uh, a nice shady space. And uh, before I left there, it was, a, it was becoming a really nice shade garden. Um, so you can create shade in that space, but uh, uh, in the meantime, probably full sun things. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, somebody asked me, um, uh, oh, about running uh, their drip line under sidewalks. Um, I wish I had a video on this. I had run, I had to cut all of my irrigation under under sidewalks and things at my old house, um, but long before I had this channel. Uh, I use my little trenching shovel and I just go, uh, right underneath the sidewalk from both sides, um, about maybe a third in from one side and a third in from the other side. And then I just take a steel pipe and I uh, um, create the hole the rest of the way through with a hammer and a steel pipe and uh, create, create the rest of the hole. And then I'll slide a one inch or a, if you can, an inch and a half uh, PVC pipe through there. And that'll create a sleeve where you can run electric through and you can run drip irrigation through and whatever you need to run through. I really wish when people put in sidewalks, and if you ever hire anybody to put in a sidewalk or a driveway, uh, make sure you go out there before they start pouring that concrete and put sleeves in. Um, I really wish uh, that every single concrete piece that ever gets poured had places where you could slide things through later. Um, it really is uh, uh, strange that we don't do that. A piece of PVC would not be very expensive um, you know, to lay in, lay in the trench underneath it beforehand. Uh, but we don't uh, for whatever reason. But yeah, I use the trenching shovel from each side, uh, just a you know maybe a, like I say a third in, and then I punch the way the rest of the way through. And then you got to be careful to pack soil back under there really well to prevent a weak spot under your concrete. That's the way I do that. Um, somebody asked me about growing a Chinese snowball in zone uh, 10, and uh, this um, I had a similar question. Uh, later, planting conditions for Japanese maple. Uh, so I'm going to combine these uh, two two questions because uh, Chinese snowball is um, for zone six to nine is what you'll see on all the tags. They want to grow one in zone ten, and I would imagine that uh, the reason it doesn't grow in zone ten is because you're just not getting enough winter. Um, a lot of these plants are from temperate areas where you get summer and winter. And uh, so the plants actually require some dormancy, even though that one's an evergreen, uh, viburnum, the Chinese snowball, uh, it does require some dormancy, some time to take a break in the winter time and zone 10 just may not offer it uh, enough of that cold. Um, and I see plants when we plant them in areas that are too warm, they'll do okay the first year or two and then they decline over time. You'll see that with bulbs too. If you put tulips in the, too far south and they're not getting cold treatment, they'll come up the first year, look fantastic because they've already had that stored energy. And then the next year, uh, they're like half as tall and kind of stunted. And then the third year they're gone. Um, that, that's what tends to happen on plants where they're not getting the cold treatment that they require in the winter time. So I'm guessing that's what it is. The other question was the uh, planting conditions for a Japanese maple, because you know, a Japanese maple, let's say grows in zone five to nine. If you're in zone, uh, but and then the tag might say full sun. The tag on this Japanese maple said full sun. If you're, um, I talked about this in a how to read a plant tag video this year. It wasn't that long ago, a few months back. Uh, and I, I talked about in that video, let's say a plant is hardy in zone five to eight and you're in zone eight B. Uh, it's very possible that full sun is too much for that plant uh, in eight B. Even if it's a full sun, if you know, it says full sun on the tag, 
uh, in zone five, six, seven, that's going to be fine. By the time you get to eight, it may be something that needs a little bit of a break uh, in the afternoon, and that's going to be the case with that Japanese maple. Uh, so it's really hard on a plant tag to have something that grows in that wide of area. And then um, it, the plant tag probably should say uh, full sun in zone five, six, seven, uh, part shade in zone eight, or part shade in zone seven and eight, that kind of thing, um, based on whatever it is. But that Japanese maple in the southeast um, zone seven or eight uh, does need part shade. Mine does fantastic back here in this pot. You probably can't see it very well. Holly's is, is behind Holly, um, but it does fantastic. And it's getting full sun. Uh, sun's about to be on it now, uh, eight o'clock in the morning, and it'll be on it till about 1.30, and then it's in the shade the rest of the afternoon. If I was in zone five, it could definitely take a lot more sun than that. Uh, okay, um, somebody asked me for screening plants on the north side of their house in Louisiana. Uh, I did a video uh, back uh, right at the end of last year, the beginning of this year, 30 screening plants. Uh, it was 10 screening plants, I think, in each of the uh, three different videos. And um, I'll link that up here in the corner uh, for you, and uh, you can take a look at that. I, and the reason I point that out is because I shot that video in southern Alabama at a nursery in southern Alabama at Flowerwood. And so everything that's in that video, every, every one of those screening plants would be good for you uh, in your area. Okay, um, somebody asked me about viburnum leaf curl. Uh, when viburnums, I've got a shindo viburnum here. I've got several viburnums uh, in this yard. Uh, when some, some viburnum get uh, leaf curl and, from aphids, uh, aphids can do some damage to the plant. I think thrips can cause it as well, but not, not as much. I don't see thrips that often, uh, but I, aphids, uh, can cause the leaves to curl. Um, this is a prog viburnum, which is an evergreen one, uh, but it's most likely related to having aphids earlier in the season, um, which you could get, you could use insecticidal soap or horticultural oil or something like that on. Do not spray, I would not spray a general insecticide on them because um, that's gonna set up a situation where you kill the ladybugs and all the predator, all the things that will eat aphids uh, as well. And then the aphids are gonna come back even stronger. So keep that in mind, you want to, uh, um, Use a delicate hand controlling aphids because um, if you kill all the things that eat aphids, the aphids are even worse when they come back around. They can breed so fast and produce so fast. But that leaf curl you have on your viburnums most likely um, was caused by aphids earlier in the season. Okay, um, you would look for them probably by May uh, of next year, something like that, uh, on the newest growth on the plant. Okay, uh, let's see. Somebody asked me for fast growing things to create a temporary privacy. They planted a screen, screening, they planted screening plants and then, but they're growing so slowly that they wanted something in between them or stepped back from them that would grow faster while they wait for these things to grow and then they want to remove the things that grew fast. Uh, and I, I would have to say that um, anything that I recommended to you that grew fast, let's say it's Ely Agnes or Le Ligustrum or green giant arborvita or you know we could go through a list of very fast growing screening plants and I've got a playlist on the channel called screening plants that screening plant video that I just um, talked about just a minute ago with the 30 screening plants uh, any of most of the things in that video are fast growing things the problem is getting them out of the ground later is going to be your problem um, all those fast growing things hollies uh, might be in that group a few few different hollies uh, they anchor themselves like to middle earth they're hard to get out of the ground so uh, i don't know um, you know something like a shindo viburnum super fast growing uh, really difficult to get out later i had a hard time getting one out at the old house it had gotten about 20 feet tall that i wanted to get rid of um, stump stump was this big around on it in uh, just a few years so uh, I, I don't know that i would I'm not discouraging you from putting in another row to create additional screen. I just don't know that you're going to be able to get them out as easily as you would want to get them out later. Um, let's see. Uh, somebody asked me about, uh, this is another transplant shock uh, thing where they're, uh, they planted sunshine ligustrum. I don't know if you can, can we see this one in here? I don't know. Um, they planted a sunshine ligustrum and it started losing uh, leaves or having some brown leaves. That's completely normal. Um, uh, Chinese privet are uh, notorious for shedding leaves uh, after they're planted. They are notorious for shedding leaves sometime in the late winter. Um, a lot of leafy evergreen things um, are actually, actually do lose their leaves 
but they wait until the new growth is coming on them in the spring. Azaleas are a great example of that. Azaleas in the spring, they're blooming, but they're also losing leaves at the same time, and then new leaves uh, come onto the plant. So they're, they're evergreen, but they're just, um, they're losing leaves. They're just losing them at a different time of year. Privet will do that. And sometimes the privet will lose their leaves before the new growth starts and people panic uh, in the spring. Um, it happens about every third, fourth year. So uh, they'll be naked temporarily, but it's just no big deal. They'll flush right back out from it. Uh, you have to back off the water when those things happen though. Make sure that you don't, um, it's easy to overwater when something's under, when you plant a plant and it becomes stressed, uh, back off on the watering really quickly because it can no, it's no longer going to be able to use the amount of water it was using before it became stressed. Um, you can set up a situation to, uh, to drown it pretty quick. Uh, somebody asked me, um, they have a, a, a clarodendron or a light bulb plant, they call it, um, and a, 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 a sweet a flowering, a, a, a flowering almond. I wanted to know when to uh, prune those, but those are both ones that bloom on old growth. Anything that blooms on old wood, you prune after it flowers. So the flowering almond and the clarodendron, um, you would do after they, uh, uh, after they flower. Somebody asked me if I was Italian because my hands are always doing this. No, I got my, uh, I've actually had my DNA done and I am about 50% German and about 50% English, but I do have the Italian hand thing happening. Uh, I, I realize that I can't sit still. I do have uh, 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 all of my report cards from elementary and middle school where he's very bright but he can't sit still uh, i was definitely uh, uh i definitely have a hyperactivity issue uh let's just call it that <laughs> which is which has served me well as an adult uh being able to accomplish you know having a business and you know having at one time i had three different businesses and, and you know all the things i can accomplish uh, helps me as an adult was not a good thing as a kid um, but i do this constantly uh okay um Somebody asked me, okay, they have a Chinese elm that was planted in new construction, 10 feet tall, but it was planted too deep. Um, they've gone in and, and uncovered the root flare. You know, at the bottom of a tree, if you see a tree grow naturally, you'll see the flare. It, there's a flare right at the base before it goes into the ground. We call that the root flare. Uh, if you don't see the root flare on a tree, uh, typically that means at some point it got buried too deep. It could have been the grower that you know, maybe transplanted it at the nursery at some point into a larger pod and sunk it too deep. Um, it could be that the, the landscaper that put it in or you or whoever, whoever planted it last, planted it too deep, but you should see that root flare. They dug down four or five inches, found the root flare. Now they got a tree that's kind of sitting in a little pocket and wanted to know whether I would raise it. I would raise it based on whether or not it's still easy to raise. Uh, that, that's probably, I mean, that's, um, that's an answer that only a shovel can decide. If, if I, I might go around that thing after it loses leaves this fall and start to, uh, to cut around it a little bit with a shovel and see uh, how easy it is. If I can make a circle around it uh, pretty easily where the roots just haven't gone crazy, uh, then I'm probably gonna lift it up and put some soil under it. Uh, if it looks like you're going to potentially damage the tree in the process of doing it, I just leave it be uh, and just make sure that you're not filling that hole with mulch every time. It's not ideal. Obviously it's not ideal, but you can only, I would just base this on, on that. Unfortunately, those elms can root pretty quickly, um, uh, and zelkovas as well. They can root in pretty quickly uh, to a space, but maybe in a single season, it will be, it will be easy to raise. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, the last one um, for this week um, is a good question. They wanted to know how to protect their big leaf hydrangea, hydrangea macrophylla from winter uh, damage because um, it dies to the ground every year, which in zone five would be, you know, maybe not that uh, abnormal, but they're in zone seven and they have a hydrangea dying to the ground every year. My guess is, is you have a floral hydrangea potentially. Uh, a lot of the florist hydrangeas are not um, as hardy and will get killed to the ground. And they're, they were grown really for, you know, just, it was a variety that was picked solely for its flowers and in a greenhouse uh, environment. That's my guess. It, a, a hydrangea macrophylla should not be, the wood should not be killed on it to the ground uh, every winter. If you have one like that, I'm probably replacing it. I don't, I don't even understand the point of it. I've seen it happen before though. And uh, my guess was, um, you know, it's a, it's a florist hydrangea variety at some point. Uh, maybe a nurseryman took cuttings from one and you know, whatever. I, I don't know where it came from. You know, maybe it came from a, you know, uh, 
uh, one of the uh, BJ's or Costco or one of those kinds of places quite possibly was grown as a greenhouse hydrangea that way. Um, that, that's my guess. Um, it, it, I would replace it with one that is, uh, that is, that is more cold hardy, something like Dear Dolores or, you know, one of the new Vermontant varieties that, um, you know, blooms every year. So then even if you get damage, you'll still get flowers on it, but it shouldn't die. The wood should not die completely to the ground. That doesn't mean the flower buds won't occasionally be damaged by cold, but the wood itself shouldn't be dying to the ground. So anyway, thank you guys for participating in this. If you ask questions down below this video, I will uh, answer them in um, two weeks from now will be the next uh, question and answer video. And again, like I say, I pick, you know, 13 or 14 questions each time. And uh, I don't mean to offend anyone if, you know, um, or to take it, you know, don't, don't take it poorly if I don't ask your question. And please do ask it again. And, um, and uh, maybe I'll find it in the next one. Next week is Subscriber Sunday. Thanks for watching.